Hi, everybody. Welcome to the latest Second Chance chat for our JSTOR Access in Prison celebration of Second Chance Month. Um, next week, we're going to be beaming in live from the Maine Department of Corrections to talk about how technology inside prison changes what opportunities look like for people who are incarcerated. But today, we're going to talk about a very real problem inside prisons, and that's disabilities, accommodations, and most importantly, solutions. We'll hear from Ben Wright and Matthew Maxey, who have lived experience of navigating prison with a disability, and Jennifer Montag, the Director of Disability Services at Marion Technical College. And she's created a free toolkit to help promote accessibility inside prisons. And we'll link that in the chat throughout this discussion. I said here, Ben and Matthew, intentionally, because most of us live in the hearing world, and we take it for granted what that means. Ben and Matthew are deaf, and that word means something different to different groups of people. I invite everyone here to discard preconceived notions and expectations. This webinar was very challenging because I took many things for granted while planning it. I've never attempted anything like this before, and it may be messy. <laughs> I think it's important to share that with everyone here um, because when we think about accessibility and accommodation, sometimes it can be scary to try something new. And I hope that this is polished and professional, but the truth is, since this is all new to me, um, I just want to convey to you honestly that this is really an invitation to extend grace to each other and to, it's, and to be a reminder that success may come incrementally, but we most certainly can get where we need to go together. So special thanks to Juni Ahari and Kimberly Lutz, who found compatible live closed captioning services and accommodations for this event. That link is in the chat. We will update it constantly in case anyone falls off. Uh, we want to make sure it stays available to anyone who joins in. Um, we also have uh, Jennifer Smith Dudash and Lee Wright from the Ohio Encompass, who are interpreters today. Jennifer was very generous with her time. She walked me through complications and provided us with insight and technical assistance to help make this possible today. So without further delay, um, I would like to start with Ben and Matthew and then Jennifer introducing themselves. And then as always, throughout the chat, please enter your questions into the chat so we can incorporate your thoughts into the event. So let's start off with Ben, um, just tell us a little bit about who, who you are and uh, what you're doing right now. Hi, my name is Ben Wright. Uh, my name sign is be on the head. Um, I was going to use my voice, but for the purpose of this presentation, I decided to sign and rely on the interpreter. Um, I, when I signed it, actually, I feel like it models um, the deaf experience and it shows um, that deaf people can fall in multiple different categories and some um, are just in the hearing world and, but anyway, um, so a little bit of background on myself and then, um, and what I'm doing now. So I, back in 2010, I graduated from Ohio State University um, with the English degree. And then I master, I got my master's in deaf education, special education, deaf education there at OSU. Um, I've been, I taught for about 10 years. And then in 2018, um, um, I, I, I was accused of, of, of something and, um, which is not what we're here for, um, but, but I felt like it's pertinent to the, to, to the story is that this is my first time um, entering the, um, really the court system. Um, <clears throat> the first time I went to jail, um, the first time I went to jail, there was no interpreter. Um, there was no TTY even, there was no video phone. Uh, there was no access to communication. My first time going into the courtroom, uh, my mom was present and she noticed there was not an interpreter in the courtroom. So she, um, went up to the, the, clerk and said hi where's the interpreter and the secretary said well that's not something we do we don't provide we don't provide interpreters for court so that was my first experience um working you know going into the courthouse and um and everything just kind of snowballed from there um so anyways i went to prison and i was there for about three years um hang on 
I think we have some technical issues here. Um, so while I was in prison, I didn't want to just sit around and do nothing for three years. Um, I wanted to be active. Um, so while I was in prison, I got involved with uh, MTC, which is Marion Technical College. Um, I took uh, business management classes. Um, and fortunately, um, I did have access to interpreting services, um, thanks to um, the jail there, um, or Jen specifically, um, and, and she can talk about that experience. Um, and then I, I started tutoring um, some of the deaf and hard of hearing students. Um, they were like, oh, Ben, you're a teacher. You could, you could be a tutor. Um, really, I'm, I'm not a tutor. I'm, I'm definitely a teacher. Um, and they wanted, like, I, I'm used to writing, like, IEPs. Um, but uh, so they would ask me to write, like, lesson plans. Now, understand that I'm, I don't have access to technology or, or Internet. Um, so that, that plan was, I, I turned that down. But access for those other inmates um, and the, the, it's the adult basic education so the ABE classes um, so for so inmates could um, try to get their GED um, really they're the high school education what I want to stress though is that the other deaf inmates um, or just people that have disabilities are that people that are People that have disabilities that are prisoners, 38% of prisoners have a disability. Uh, it's a number that I got from Jen. Um, and a lot of those disabilities are hidden disabilities and they they don't share that. They don't willingly always share that information. Um, you know, we think about why people go to prison in the first place. Um, they probably don't come from a stable background. Um, they don't have the appropriate access to education, the appropriate um, services in general um, sorry, long tangent to get back to where to where I where I is. Um, so once I got out of prison, I immediately was very frustrated, and so I reached out um, to Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities or State BBR um, to help me look for a job. Um, so that's when I got linked up with Jennifer Smith Dudash and her agency. Um, her and I worked together, struggled together. Um, I've interviewed and um, was offered positions of nine, I think nine times in the last year, which means my interview, my interview, my interviewing went well. well um, my application looked great, my resume looked great, but nine times I interviewed, was offered a job, but then once my background check hit, um, I created additional complications. So I, so I found um, the Southern New Hampshire University and I found Project AIM, which is led by Dr. Matthews, and the purpose of Project AIM is to help people who are currently incarcerated to find access to higher education opportunities, and people who are out of prison, helping them find jobs and helping with transportation and, and homes, and which, it's funny. Um, I can't find a job, but I've been able to help other people find a job. Um, but I'm very thankful to Dr. Matthews and, and her faith in me. And so now I'm a master's student majoring in English Lit, and I just got accepted into the MFA program, which is a master of um, Master of Fine Art. I'm getting my MFA. Um, so I'm doing both simultaneously. So that's what I'm doing now. But still don't have any money. I'm living with my grandmother. Um, I'm super grateful for my grandmother to provide space for me. But at the same time, I, I would like my independence, but I can't really afford that right now. So still trying to navigate that. Um, but ultimately, that's me wrapped in a bubble. Ben, that's a big bubble. Um... Yeah. There's a lot that we're going to come back and revisit later. Um, Matthew, uh, tell us a little bit about you and um, your experience and um, and the cool stuff you're doing now. And then we're going to uh, go over to Jennifer and talk a little bit about um, some of those issues and then put Ben and Jennifer in conversation. So Matthew. Yeah. 
All right, so do you want my so you want my experience? You want to know who I am and what I'm doing now, right? Those three things? Yeah. Okay. All right. The reader's digest um, version. Right. Oh, for sure, for sure. Uh, <laughs> right, so um, my name is Matt. My current name is Matt with the Um by myself and the founder of a company a brand company called Definitely Dope, which is D-E-A-F-I-N-I-T-E-L-Y-D-O-P-E. -E. And that brand was actually created after all my experiences with jail. It was created more to be able to bridge communities to death and healing through sign language and music. So since then, it's led to me working festivals, interpreting for concerts, interpreting for MTV, performing for schools, universities, different social media apps, pretty much everything you use, I've tried to bring sign language to the platform. And it's been an incredible journey over the last probably seven years after I decided to stop being foolish and stop getting in trouble. So uh, <laughs> my experience was more of uh, just um, a variety. I was faced with a situation in D.C. I faced with a situation in Jacksonville, Florida, and I faced with a situation in Beverly Hills, California. And Beverly Hills, California was actually the first time I dealt with law enforcement, but the whole time the experience with that from the start to finish, I did not know how to interact with people that were deaf, especially people that were deaf and could communicate. So even though I told them I'm pretty much all output, no input. I can say everything all day, but whatever you tell me, I'm not going to comprehend it. But for some reason, it almost made them more mad. Like I didn't realize the stereotype of that people pretended to be deaf which actually made it harder for people who were actually deaf to deal with those kind of situations. And being in jail, it was just more like I have a ton of questions, but nobody had the patience to really write them out, get an interpreter, communicate, whatever. This was back in maybe like 2010, 2011, so cell phones were still on the up and up, technology was still developing, it still wasn't really as that. The experience that really stood out more was when I had to spend three days in jail in Jacksonville, Florida. And that was actually from start to finish. I had an interpreter with me before they even arrested me. And as they were trying to question me, I'm like, can you talk to the interpreter? No, we don't want to talk to her. You can talk. We're talking to you. How many times do I have to tell you? The interpreter is right here. Can you help me out, please? No, we are not using it. You know that's against the ADA at all, right? We don't care. We are not using it. Forget this. Okay, whatever. And from there, one thing led to another. I was better. They were better. We did. I got into jail, and then um, I just remember my hearing aid batteries, they died. So I didn't have any kind of communication. Even now, I can hear everything that's going on. But once it's dead, I practice my hearing, but it doesn't mean that it's automatically guaranteed I'm going to understand. No matter how I sound, no matter how clear I talk, no matter how much I may act hearing instead of deaf or disabled, it still qualifies me as disabled. And as much as I try to communicate that to them, I just could not understand anything that was going on in that jail in Jacksonville. And it got to the point where the inmate, the inmates were actually more helpful and more expressive and more directional and more like, hey, you know what, you can come out now, you're good. Hey, we're going to eat, we got food. If I just talk to the officers that were in the area, I'm going to tell you again, I'm done. I don't care. Do I do? That's how it looked to me. I'm like, okay, you know what, forget y'all. Y'all not helping, this is not going to help at all. Y'all are helping. I appreciate the help. And then it stuck in my head. I actually came out of jail from that situation and created a video talking about 10 signs for law enforcement that they should know. And they actually gained over like 25 million views on Facebook. And from there, I actually started kind of helping me realize 
oh, there's a lot of other people who deal with these kind of situations, but their story has not been told. Or the way that they communicate, it has not been told in a different way for other people who need to understand their story. And that's where I realized maybe I can kind of help bridge that gap as well, because I am deaf, hard of hearing, I talk and I sign, and maybe that can help bring it over to the hearing world so that they can understand more how to help the deaf community or people with hearing loss deal with life in these situations, whether it's with law enforcement, prison, or jail, or jail. Thank you so much, Matthew. I love that. Um, so Jennifer, um, you've heard the um, trials and travails, literally, of our our panelists with lived experience, and you're an educator uh, of disabilities and you work inside jails and prisons. What are your, um, first introduce yourself and your, I'm sorry, we don't have like three hours to go over <laughs> all of your credentials, but um, but they're vast, trust me people, they are vast. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that and then speak a little bit to like the the challenges that that um, these two have 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 brought to to our attention. Absolutely, um, I am actually taking notes of things to make sure that we touch on based on what Ben and Matthew have been saying. And I was like, forget introducing me. Let's just get into the meat and potatoes here. Um, my name is Jennifer Montag, and I'm the director of disability services at Marion Technical College, and. When I, I'm going to tell a story, it's going to be a very short story. When I arrived as the inaugural disability service provide, director for the college five years ago, I was sitting in a dean's meeting about two weeks after I started. I'm new, I'm just learning the ropes, and there was a dean who leaned over and said, well, we've got 350 students enrolled at our correctional sites. And I said, oh, wait a second, <laughs> we're teaching in the prisons? And they said, yes. And I said, so what are we doing for accommodations? And they said, nothing. And I said, okay, we need to talk because we're going to have to figure this out. So fast forward um, about two more weeks and Mr. Wright decided that he was going to enroll in classes at one of our sites <clears throat> that fall. <laughs> and so I had to quickly figure out how we were going to provide real time, um, sign, sorry, sign language interpreters in the correctional setting. Um, fortunately, fortunately, the state of Ohio had a Department of Justice settlement agreement that occurred in 2016 because they were not providing accommodations in the correctional system. Um, so the Department of Corrections had to follow a whole program of required steps to meet accessibility per the federal government. One of those things was that they had to contract with an interpreting agency to provide on-site interpreters at the correctional facilities, and they've identified correctional facilities that would fit that. And one of those is right here in Marion, where we provide classes. So we have a large population of deaf and hard of hearing individuals who sign who are located there. Because I was new to Ohio, I actually relied on that interpreting agency to start connecting with the interpreting community to find interpreters that were qualified, badged to go inside, and or interested so I could get them through the background check and get them badged. Um, so that is, in a nutshell, what I've been doing. Before we go on, I just want to share because communication is one of the things we're talking about. We mentioned TTYs, and if you're not familiar with the deaf community, the TTY is the teletypewriter, which is the old means of communicating on a phone system, back when we had phones, um, that would allow a person to type out what they wanted to say, the person would receive and read it, and it would come back. So it operated very much like on a modem, but in real time as opposed to a fax. The VP or the video phone is actually very similar to using a web camera on the internet and being able to communicate directly with another person in real time using sign language. And if I wanted to call somebody who didn't know sign language, there are video relay interpreters that would actually facilitate that communication. So if I wanted to call for pizza, I could call up Domino's through the relay system, sign my order, and the taker at Domino's 
would then just write down what my order was. Although we can do that on the cell phones now with technology. But I just wanted to touch on that and something that Matthew shared, and Ben, you might be able to also speak to it because both of you, because you speak, there's that assumption that you can also hear. And if you can't, there's the assumption that, oh, lip reading, I'll take care of it. Studies have found the best lip readers only get 30% of the lip reading. Okay, so I'm gonna give you all a quick test. You guys ready for a test? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something, but you're not gonna hear it. You tell me what I say, okay? Okay, any idea what I said? I said two vegetables. Peas and beans. Very similar, very similar lip shapes. It's all in the context. What are you going to talk about? So when we talk about meeting the needs of people with disabilities in the correctional setting, especially in correctional education, as Stacy said earlier, we really need to expand our understanding of that and, and not make those assumptions that if I can hear the person speaking, they can understand if I talk to them. Even if they're wearing hearing aids that have working batteries, Matthew, um, all <laughs> it does is amplify everything. So it amplifies in the correctional setting, all the noises that are occurring. So if you're in the dorm or you're in your cell, you have all those noises going on around you and the, the CO is talking to you and your hearing aids are kind of working, but it's amplifying everything around you. Um, so I think, I think education is probably, and I don't mean college education, I mean education of what having a disability is and isn't is critical. And so this I think is a start of that and I really appreciate having the opportunity to share that. Did I answer your question? Oh, you could go on for days. <laughs> um, so the this idea of the, the visible versus not visible and then challenging our assumptions about what constitutes a disability and deciding who's disabled. Sometimes those are like things that we decide for ourselves even though we're not like doctors and stuff. Is that fair? Okay. Ben. Um, so you came to prison with a degree and an education background. And then despite all of your credentials, they said that you were a tutor, which probably didn't feel great. Um, I want you to tell me a little bit more about how you applied your education before prison to help the people inside the prison who had disabilities because you worked with people inside prisons who had disabilities other than hearing related, correct? Right. Um, so first, um, like what, what is the disability? I'm um, so if you can imagine yourself as being hearing and you want to go to a deaf social, um, there's all these deaf people hanging out, right? And you're the only hearing person in that room. You don't know sign language and you walk in and everyone in the room is signing. So imagine that, right? So imagine how are you going to accommodate, how are you going to be accommodated for that situation? Um, now imagine yourself with a disability. So I, I just want to just give you some different lenses to look through. Um, so people that speak Spanish, if they were to walk into um, you know, an American prison where everybody predominantly speaks English, they need the accommodation. They need an accommodation. And so that's how I'm viewing disabilities in prison. It's not just about, oh, they're deaf or they're blind or they're, uh, you know, they have Down syndrome or cerebral palsy. Um, and mental health is an issue too. So if you add that, um, there's many, 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 many people who acquire mental health issues while they're incarcerated because of the many, many reasons that, that people can be traumatized. So we have to think about disability and, and what that really looks like. Uh, I think that number is not 38%. I think it's much larger than 38% of people in prison have a disability. Um, and then we had COVID and people were really not really sure what's happening because we're in a prison. 
and you know, or we're in the hole, and um, and people who can't read and can't write, how are they able to learn? Uh, the JPay system is all, you know, that handles all of our emails. So I think the warden sends out like a, you know, sends out a massive email about all the rules, and this is during COVID. And I noticed a lot of inmates had no idea what that email, like why they broke a rule, because. Yeah, you know, it was it was in that email that the warden sent out, and the people were getting punished for rules that they broke that they were only notified of through this email. Um, I'm like, if they don't know the rules, how are they going to follow the rules? Um, and then then you stack on the fact that you know they have disabilities, and um, you know it's not just deaf people, it's not just blind people, um, it's the whole gamut. My education, um, you know, from the court system to you know the court system. Um, I felt like the judicial system really hurt me. And I, and the reason why I say that, one thing that I tried talking with the judge, um, I didn't really, when the judge was talking, I didn't really fully understand, um, like, you know, they, they talk about the Miranda rights, what? Um, and they were trying to argue that piece. Um, I had an interpreter, but the interpreter was not certified. Um, the interpreter wasn't really qualified. They just weren't a very good interpreter. Um, and that, that was my argument point, but the judge was like, nope, I'm sorry, because Ben has the ability to read lips. Ben has the ability to talk. He absolutely understood everything that was happening. He has a master's degree. He should understand, he understands. My master's degree is in education. It's not, it's not, it's not in the legal system. Um, so I, I felt like that really hurt me there. Um, I was just when I was in prison, um, I did get help there because people realized that I could help them. Um, for a long time, um, I was always well-educated. I, I, I worked as an advocate for my students, for my deaf students that I worked with. Um, I, I've always been an advocate um, growing up and, and, in my, and in my profession. But when I got to prison, I thought, oh, I can still advocate. But we had like 15 deaf or hard of hearing people incarcerated in that one prison. I was the only one who had the ability to read and write above a kindergarten level. Of those 15 deaf people, I, and so I was relied on a lot for support, um, to help. I'm not, not saying that they are stupid. Um, they just don't have the language exposure of English. They don't have, they aren't exposed to English as much as hearing people are. Um, you know, they, they, these are brilliant individuals. There's one deaf person that wanted to wanted to take some classes, but he kept failing the the placement exams. Um, and so I asked Jennifer if you know Jennifer could step in because I felt like this deaf person was very very intelligent. It's just English wasn't um, it was not their native language. Um, and so I, I was I tried to be helpful there and really just. Um, it allowed me an opportunity to to see the deaf people and see what they needed um, when it came to education. Um, so I want to come back to this advocacy piece in a minute, but there is a question from the audience, um, and the the person says they work inside a college that runs inside San Quentin, and I'm hoping it's Mount Tamalpai because I love Mount Tam. Um, and if not, if you're a higher ed program working in prison, we're we're friends already. But special place in my heart for San Quentin and Mount and Mount Mount Tam. Um, so they're wondering about getting their own interpreters for students, since they have three interpreters for the whole prison, and they said they're often busy and they don't come to support our students in the classroom. So the question is, what requirements are necessary to have someone interpret for us? Do they need a license? And I think that this is an excellent segue to that based on Ben's own experience of having to translate uh, Matthew telling us how like it was the other people, the, the uh, other people who were incarcerated who supported each other and that burden of making sure people are cared for is falling on the, the inmate population. So Jennifer, do you have any guidance for our friends in maybe Mount Tam? I'm I'm going to go on a limb and assume it is Mount Tam since it's out at San Quentin. Um, I do believe, and 
I'm not up to date on all of the states that have required licensure for interpreters, for sign language interpreters, but I do believe California is one of the ones that was leading it. Um, so you would want to check with the state's Department of yeah. Office of Deaf and Hard of Hearing and um, find out what the requirements are for that. So the state has an office for deaf and hard of hearing. Um, right. But one of the things to think about is Mount Tam is offering the, the program and as the college, it is the college's responsibility to provide the equal and equitable access to the program services and activities. So if, if you're not able to meet that through the means of the three interpreters that are at San Quentin for all, oh gosh, is it 3,000 in incarcerated population there? It's huge. Um, then looking at building in your own support service would be an appropriate approach. And if Mount Tam as a college, and I'm assuming it's a um, Title II entity under the ADA, which is a state or local government. Um, if it's a privately run college, then it would be Title III, but they're so similar under the legal requirements that legally the college is responsible to ensure that access. Having actually an ADA center or an ADA coordinator for the college would be critical to meet the needs, not only of the deaf students, but any student with a disability. Um, but putting together interpreters that you would have, either you have contract interpreters that are ones that you contract with for the semester for those classes, or you actually look at the cost benefit analysis and it may be less expensive to hire and provide um, the benefits for that interpreter and you have your own staff interpreter. So. The, there's a there's a university, a very large university, who has correctional education at five or six prisons. Their staff of disability services is huge. It's like 26 service providers plus 20 sign language interpreters that are staff interpreters. Nine of those staff interpreters were actually went through the background check and badged to go into the prisons. They saw that that need was there and they made sure that they had the services available. So I would say um, looking at your options and how you can meet those requirements and meeting the needs of the inmate, the those who are incarcerated, but also looking at what the requirement is for the state. And I'm 99% sure that California has a licensure requirement for interpreters. So when there is a licensing requirement um, for interpreter services, who has to pay for that? For the is there money somewhere? Yeah, is, is there it... like a bucket of money? Like the state says, hey, you know, the colleges and prisons have to offer um, these services, whether it's for um, interpreting or, you know, readers for people who are dyslexic. Um, okay, you have to do it, but who's footing the bill? Is there like a budget? Can you like go say, hey, Mr. Newsom, I, I need some money so I can talk to my students? You would have to check with your state to see if there is anything like that. At the federal level, this is a federal law. It's an unfunded mandate for colleges. There is no pool of money. When the ADA came into fruition, there was no pool of money set aside for accommodations. And that was probably one of the biggest sticking points 31 years ago when it was passed um, for private companies and also for colleges and universities to say, it's gonna cost us so much money. Um, but the federal government ultimately says, basically what they say is, we don't care how much it costs, you need to make it accessible. And I, the reason I say that is a lot of schools ask, can they, get, can they not provide an accommodation based on an undue burden under the ADA? That's one of the caveats in the law. The, um, what they look at, what the federal government looks at if there's a complaint in terms of the undue burden is they look at the entire institution, not, dis, not just disability services. So I have $60,000 in my budget for disability services, which might get me a semester of interpreting services that I can provide. But after that, if I don't have the money, it comes to the to the whole entire institution. Um, and the institution is actually ultimately responsible. So unfortunately, there aren't grants, generally speaking. 
There may be a state level grant if they're really pushing for correctional education, and that would be something to investigate, but I don't, I'm not aware of that widely across uh, the states. So uh, another follow-up question from our um, audience is the, we're talking about people who have a known disability. Now, Matthew and Benjamin both have confirmed diagnoses and they still have a challenge being um, respected and treated in the way that is, is um, you know, basic human dignity. Um, but they, um, they have an advantage, right? Because they have a diagnosis. So what are the challenges in getting someone diagnosed? Like if you can't even get accommodations in there, what is it like for someone to be evaluated to get a diagnosis? And and Ben, I'm really curious in your experience, because you know, you've put in I you have put IEPs together as part of your professional life beforehand. Like what does that look like? Well, it just really depends on what state you're in. Um, the state of Ohio, and I know there are other states that are very similar, um, they, have this, they have a similar process. When, um, when a person is first um, you know, convicted of a felony and they're going to the prison, um, they go to the CRC, um, um, basically, a, a, basically a reception center, where they kind of assess you and figure out which prison would be a better fit for you um, around the state. Um, where they determine where they're going to send you. So they have a mental health person who, um, you know, they 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 take like maybe up to five minutes to assess uh, mental health. They say, "Hi, do you want to kill yourself? Do you want to hurt yourself?" Um, you know, those standard questions they run through, and if the inmate says no, they're done. They move on. And that's kind of it. That's really the only mental health assessment. Um, it's it's not a very um, intense um, assessment. I don't know if it's because of budget or just staffing issues. I don't know. Uh, but there's a lot of people who have disabilities who um, maybe they don't know about it. Maybe they do know about it. And they're just maybe too embarrassed to share that information. Um, or they just choose not to disclose because, you know, I, they, they're just running through the standard assessments. Um, as a teacher working K through 12, yes, I've assessed lots of kids um, very um, intensely. And um, also you work with the team, you've got the school psychologist and um, other members of the team. But what happens is that, so we have the person who gets sent off to prison um, and if things go awry, then that's when the state kind of like backtracks and like, oh, maybe we should do another reevaluation. But it's not until a crisis happens um, does the state go, oh, we should probably step in. Um, but there's a lot of deaf people that have, they're deaf, but they also have some other disabilities, um, some invisible disabilities, maybe. Um, so, but oftentimes, oftentimes they're just labeled as being deaf. And, but really, there's more to it. Um, it it's sad, but I mean, it's, that's kind of the, the reality. So it's like, oh, we checked off this box, so you're deaf, and then we don't investigate the other disabilities that could be underlying or, you know. Um, so Basically. are prisons, uh, another, another question. Sorry, uh, Ben, just from where I sit, when you turned your, I was like, what happened? Because it looked like you reached into Matthew's the way you're on my screen. I was like, how'd that happen? Sorry, it looked like you were together for a minute on my screen. Um, I was very confused. So um, are colleges allowed to bring in professionals to make diagnoses? Um, or are these people that uh, are supplied by the DOC, like, people who are badged by the DOC to make assessments. Can how do colleges um, meet some of these demands um, if they can't get in to diagnose people like with their own professionals? Is that a thing? I'm just gonna jump in since this has been a challenge um, and I talked about it on my website, um, some things to think about. What, what we do in college 
education is we typically do not have the services to do assessment or an evaluation for people with disabilities. Um, it's not typically done. There are some schools that may have specialized services and may have that as a, a fee for service, like Mitchell College in Connecticut focuses on uh, learning disabilities, Landmark College in Vermont focuses on learning disabilities, and they provide assessments at that school for those students to get a better understanding of where they're impacted in their learning disabilities. But on the whole, it's not required for colleges to, to do the evaluation. At the college level, unlike the K-12 level, um, the colleges are, are taking documentation that the student presents, the student is responsible for presenting it, and it has to meet the college's level of requirement of what that documentation contains. Because I work at a two-year community college and I know my community, um, we're very rural, um, it's a lower socioeconomic in environment, um, sending, sending a student away saying, well, your IEP and the ETR, which is the evaluation paperwork within the IEP, is seven years old, so you have to go get a new evaluation because I won't accept it. Just doesn't sit well with me from an equity, equity standpoint or a social justice standpoint. So what I what I do, and each college can set the requirements for a comment for documentation. What I do is, let's start with the IEP. Let's start with the ETR. See what it says. So I'm working with students who dropped out of junior high 20 years ago. I have them sign a release of information form that I had developed that was approved by our legal counsel, and I send it off to the high school. Now, technically, I could be a stickler because at the college level, it's the student's responsibility to get me the documentation. But I have decided, having worked with the school districts in our area, sometimes even for the students on campus, it's faster for me to have the student sign the release of information, fax it over to the high school, and get the documentation the same day, sometimes within the hour, after the student has been trying to get their documentation for the last two weeks from that school. So I said, I'm going to do this for the students on the outside. I'm going to do it for the students on the inside. That is the decision I made from a social justice perspective for our student population, both inside and outside. Um, so that actually has helped in in getting the documentation if they don't have the documentation the high school doesn't they have the documentation or they didn't have a disability when they were in high school so they acquired a mental health diagnosis or they were diagnosed with adhd when in high school but the school never put together a 504 plan or an iep i will work with that person to find out what clinic did you go to can we see if they have a hipaa release and then I take, I print it up and I take the HIPAA release in and have the student sign it. And then I will fax it off to the medical provider and see if we can get documentation. Ultimately, if in my communication, and I'm actually currently working with a student who, um, I haven't gotten the documentation for, but very clearly struggles with reading and writing. One of the things I do is I have the students fill out the application for services, and I watch them as they're filling it out. And well, after 20 plus years of doing this, I'm able to see most of the time when a student may be struggling with either a reading or writing disability. I'm not diagnosing it, I don't have the qualifications to diagnose it, but I can see where the struggles are, and I can do provisional accommodations until that student's documentation comes through. Um, Sometimes we're able to get the mental health provider, if I give the student my list of documentation guidelines and ask them to take it to their case manager in the mental health unit, sometimes they'll get a letter from the mental health case manager that, that states what the diagnosis is. But that's very rare and very difficult. Maybe once out of 30 times, we've gotten that. So, very so, long answer for a simple question. Well, if none of these questions are simple. And if we're being critically, you know, oh. if we're thinking critically about these issues, none of the answers are going to be, you know, turn left at the tree and you're going to hit your destination. Like, it's a pretty winding road. So, uh, so I appreciate the, 
the granularity. Um, have, um, and this is kind of for, for Matthew, I'm curious, because it sounds like when you mm -hmm. went into the jail system, right, and, the, and they're making assessment, people who are non-medical, who are making assessments about what your capabilities are to communicate, and they're saying what they need, uh, or they're dictating what you need uh, without really listening to what you need. Um, did you, did they like give you a sign on your door? Did they make you go to medical? Did they ask for somebody to validate that you had uh, some sort of hearing impediment? No, I never had. I'm gonna choose a sign this time. My voice is, my voice is done. I feel like my voice is broken, but um, I've never really had the documentation provided to people that were around, you know, people that were in charge. Um, I, I never got any sort of confirmation or assessment, never got a medical confirmation. It was just basically my word. Yeah, I'm just sharing it with the system. I, it, it's, it's my word against the system. <laughs> Good point. How about you, Ben? What was your experience? And then um, uh, what is the, uh, when you talked about people who are like incarcerated, like helping each other, uh, like if you make an assessment as the tutor, like where do you go with that information if people are kind of in the trenches together um, to try to advance education? Um, like how does that work? Where does that advocacy go? What does that look like? I know it feels like, um, you know, the three of us, um, between Matthew, Jennifer, and myself, um, it, it, I know it seems like it's been very negative, like the system's broken and yada, yada, yada. But all it takes is just one person to change everything. Um, you know, Jennifer, um, it, my first time meeting with her as a director, and she's like, wait, there, there's no services in the system? What? Hold on, you know, let, let, let's, let's change this. Um, by doing that, she has drastically, she improved everything for me. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't hear anything, like my ears don't work. I hear absolutely nothing. I can't hear they are zero noise. Um, so I, it's a very dark world that I live in. Um, and it's topsy turvy. I, I, I'm not like really, I, I'm not, I don't necessarily like hang out with all deaf people. I don't hang out with all hearing people. I'm not really into one world or the other. Um, I'm kind of like caught in between. And in the sense, I kind of lost my, my sense of self. Um, and Jennifer, by providing those, um, you know, those accommodations, um, she allowed me to just improve myself, my sense of self, my mental self, my, you know, my physical self. And just, and she's only one person, but but she she fought up against the system because the warden, uh, I mean, she she was able to talk to them and 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 really persevere, um, and and really gave me that energy. Um, and, and that allowed my spirits to be lifted. Um, I could have lost my sense of self entirely while in the system. I could have fallen to the depression. I could have, um, you know, I, I got, got myself addicted to drugs, even though I wasn't addicted to drugs before then, but there are drugs everywhere. And I very well could have um, fallen into that trap. But Jennifer kind of raised me out of that um, by just offering her help. Um, and I'm one person. And so I extend that same help to other people and the things that I'm, you know, I, things I noticed, like if I noticed somebody was struggling in class, I would go to the instructor or quote unquote instructor, the teacher that's teaching the class. Um, if they weren't being helpful, I would approach somebody to another instructor and just tell them like, hey, I, I see this person struggling or I'm struggling. Um, I would try to find another tutor if I had to. Um, and I think like there's an inmate who's in for life. Um, lifted himself up by providing tutoring to other people and, and to kind of learn from him and that energy and that spirit and use that to try to help that try to help other people because all it really does take is just one person um obviously with my family and friends i have tons of support in my personal life thank god um but jennifer definitely made my life in prison significantly better and again she's just one person 
this one person and and look at me now i'm 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 on the road to my phd and, and i'm not going to stop until i get my doctorate degree um and, and jennifer along the way just kind of advocated and 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 i allowed me to advocate for myself and me teaching other people to advocate for themselves and that's really I, to kind of answer the question i advocacy um I, it's so important to make sure that people aren't don't feel like they're alone. When you're advocating for someone, it shows that they're not alone. Um, you know, I'm hearing three, for 3,000 inmates, there's only three, three professionals that are doing mental health. Um, we are in crisis mode. We've been in crisis mode. Um, and they don't really do anything until somebody reaches crisis mode because that's where we are. Um, nobody really steps in until something, until somebody actually tries to take their own life. Um, I, I know with Jennifer and I, and uh, we, we need more Jennifers just kind of replicated throughout the country. Um, <laughs> well, we don't have, we only have, we only have one Jennifer, but, but we do have a toolkit that is available to all uh, to, to, to spread the love. Um, so we're almost um, at time. Um, Jennifer, there's another question for you, which is, um, students for students who are incarcerated what would you suggest are some good learning accommodations um the writer states the ones that they know of are incredibly incredibly limited such as extended time extra notes on exams but nothing great for writing or reading support um i'm going to answer that in one second i wanted to go back to something ben said which i think has helped me because I'm a one person office for all students on our campus. And Ben was able to, through his knowledge and experience working with the students as a tutor, he was able to identify something's not quite right. I've been able to work with the aides. So we have class aides that are um, students who have completed classes with us and then they're hired on as aides to help the faculty when we come in and to teach. But they're also the tutors for our programs they have been phenomenal in getting students connected with my office. So I hold office hours on campus because our classes are in person. Um, it's a little bit different if you have uh, correspondence courses or if you have like the JPay or GTL system, the intranet system for your courses, or if you're doing telestreamed videos, there's a whole variety and that's on that website. And these tools I developed from my research um, talking to other professionals who are providing more than just extra time on tests. Um, so take a look at all of that. Um, but having the aides be able to connect the students to me has been critical. I I have on my caseload out of basically 190 students, I have over 45 who are in the correctional system. Those are the students that I work with that are in the correctional system. Um, so it's over 25% of my caseload. But that is a majority of the, the time coming from the aides who say, you really need to go talk to Jennifer. She's here on Fridays. Let's get you a pass. And then they work with that student to get a pass from our director and they can come up and see me on Fridays. That has made a big difference. So hopefully some of you that are trying to figure out how you're going to do this in your correctional system um, are able to implement something like that. I also wanted to add um, on that website i just added all the cases for the last oh, 10 15 years that i could find related to corrections or um, law enforcement that the department of justice has come down either as a settlement agreement or as a um, consent de decree which means basically they'll just tell you this is what you're going to do and when you're going to do it and how you're going to do it um, they just had a settlement agreement with the department of corrections for minnesota in February because they were found after several complaints of not providing accommodations for the GED. Now remember in college you have to have a high school diploma or a GED. If that's the barrier for the people that want to go on and get college degree and college education and they can't even make it through the GED, we're not seeing them come into our classes. Once we get them, if your program requires a placement test, then you have to look at what accommodations you're providing for the placement test so you can get those students accurately assessed for where they're going to start classes. Um, so the answer to the question that was asked about good learning accommodations 
is extra time was basically the only accommodation 57% of the people I surveyed and interviewed what what they were providing was the extra time. There were a few others that were providing interpreters. One person was able to provide JAWS. They worked with the Department of Corrections and got JAWS on some of the lab computers. JAWS is a screen reading program for people who are blind or visually impaired. Um, but you're absolutely right. The hardest and the biggest barrier that we're having right now is accommodations for reading and writing. I was able in one of the institutions, I was able to get the scanning pen exam pen approved. It will scan a line of text and read it out loud. It's laborious because it's line by line. I'm working at both institutions with the correctional administration to have um, the ability to bring in NVDA which is actually a screen reading program for blind and visually impaired, but it works on a click of a mouse and it does not require internet access, whereas JAWS requires internet, ac internet access and um, read and write requires internet access and Kurzweil requires internet access. There has been discussion in our listserv that um, Read Speaker is working with correctional facilities to get inside and on the, the JPay or GTL systems, but I have not seen that yet. The bigger problem is, okay, now they have a reading device, so it'll read something on the computer, but how do we get them their textbooks in electronic format? How do we bring those in? So that it's basically a two-step process. Um, I have been able to get uh, students to have their tests read aloud, and that depends on the class and the teacher. Either the director will read it aloud or I will set up a time and I will read it aloud. Um, on the outside, they're all recorded or they use the, the computer in our testing center. On the inside, we have to do it old school. I have gone so old school. We're going old school on testing accommodations. I'm reading, I'm doing live reading. The other old school accommodation that I've been providing is for students in lecture classes, a note taker. So I purchase piles of carbonless paper and I, I have the director help me find a student aide who will come in and they will act as the note taker for that class for that student. Um, so it's been a process. I do have a win. I do want to share this. I just, after six months, now when we're talking deaf and hard of hearing, Ben and Matthew are both deaf using ASL. They're ASL users. There are also people who are deaf or hard of hearing, or they may call themselves hearing impaired because they've acquired the hearing loss, but it can be significant to the point of not hearing any sound at all. And I've been working with a student who's been in our classes. This has been six months of ongoing every week, trying to get this student some access. All I could give him was note takers until just recently. This student had enough hearing that if it was amplified, to about 100 decibels, he could hear it. So I finally got the institution to approve the assistive listening device, the FM system. But it took me six months of back and forth and finally connecting with the IT director at that institution to say, I need to show you this. And if an FM system works, which works on radio waves is not okay, let me know because I will purchase the infrared, which is direct line of sight, and I will buy that so that we can set it up in the, the classroom. He looked at it and he said, if the teacher has it under their control every class period and you can document that, we're good with it. I'm like, oh my goodness, it took me six weeks or six months for you to say that, um, but that worked. So there are some ways, it's just perseverance, perseverance, perseverance to get there. I was muted. Um, so there's another question in the chat. I think what I'm gonna do is um, maybe post it on the JSTOR Access in Prison uh, LinkedIn page and, and, and post the answer there um, so everyone can see it. Um, I really wanna thank everyone for coming. It was really brave and vulnerable. I'm so proud we got through it. I really want to encourage everybody who's listening, um, you know, try it, try anything, and know that there are people who have who have gone before you. Mm. There's a roadmap, 
and and the people are out there you just need to kind of put your bat signal out and um and people will find you um matthew benjamin i really appreciate the vulnerability uh jennifer smith dudash i really am grateful um lewis i didn't know that you that well beforehand but you you seem like a cool guy too um and jennifer montag you have been just a, a wonderful resource and i encourage everyone to reach out because there are so few resources in this space that are available uh, she's graciously made them available at no charge to to everybody and um and so take advantage it's a great jumping off point and i know i've learned tremendously and i'm i'm not a formal educator uh, so i'm sure you're going to get a lot more out of it than i did so thank you so much everyone i'm really grateful um if you need anything um or if you need JSTOR in your jail or prison. Thank you. Thank you.